This is Lanny Poffo, formerly the genius of WWE, and you are listening to wrestling's first audio drama, Kings of the Ring. You are listening to the Kings of the Ring Podcast Network. Welcome to another episode of your favorite monthly soap opera, Kings of the Ring. I am Steve Tatai, the writer-director of the show, and I proudly present to you a fictional and dramatic retelling of the 1980s wrestling wars. Following the rise and fall of the power brokers of the sport and the sex, drugs, and muscles lifestyle of the 80s wrestler and the sacrifices they make for success. As you heard right at the top, we're taking things up a notch with the voice cast, bringing in an actual 80s superstar to the show. The genius himself, Beeping Lanny Poffo. Lanny, part of the legendary Poffo wrestling family, headed by Father Angelo Poffo, with sons Lanny and brother Randy Poffo. Little known as the Macho Man, Randy Savage. Oh yeah. Now Lanny has wrestled all over the world for decades, and was part of one of the most famous territory wars in history, the Battle of Memphis, with the Poffos forming a rival outlaw territory, ICW, going head-to-head against Jerry Jarrett and Jerry the King Lawler's Memphis Territory. Later on, Lanny Poffo joined the WWF as the original rhyming trash talker, the poet laureate of wrestling. Decades before Max Caster and the acclaimed would trash talk an opponent in his raps before every match in AEW, Lanny Poffo used to read a poem, insulting his foe before their match, and then he would throw frisbees to the fans with said poem inscribed on it. Uh, later on, Lanny Poffo became a literal genius and managed Kurt Hennig for years, highlighted by defeating WWF world champion Hulk Hogan in 1989 on NBC. But Lanny Poffo is a living product of the era that Kings of the Ring celebrates, and we are honored to have him on the show. He's always had an awesome superhero-like voice, so who better to voice one of the new characters, the living superhero, and the forgotten bouncer from Oshkosh, Vance Armstrong. Kings of the Ring is intended for mature audiences. Today's episode would be rated MA for graphic sexual acts, anatomical descriptions, and profanity. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Kings of the Ring. It's 1977 outside of North Atlanta High School, near the track as school is letting out. Catherine Walker, a tough girl in a denim jacket, her dark brown hair and a ponytail, looking like Joe from Facts of Life, is surrounded by a small group of cheerleaders and preppies. Her daddy's a fake wrestler. <laughs> Go suck an egg. She shouts back at her aggressors. Oh yeah? What are you going to do about it? Hit me with a fake punch? <laughs> How about a real one? Ow, she broke my nose! She broke my nose! Now fuck off, or I got one for all of you. As the girls take off, a hunky senior walks up on crutches, wearing a Kiss t-shirt under his football letterman varsity jacket, with a C patch to designate captain. He's thin and muscular with a handsome face, thick, shaggy brown hair, and full sideburns like a proper 70s teen idol. Y'all right, fresh me? You can kiss my grits too. Whoa, whoa, I'll come in peace. Sorry. Those damn girls. She brushes herself off and calms down. No big deal. I'm Jack. Jack Porter. Hi, Jack. I'm Catherine. Thanks for checking on me. Hey, uh, sorry to butt in, but did them girls say your daddy's a wrestler? You want to make something of it? Uh, no, no. Uh, I reckon that's pretty cool. I always wanted to be a wrestler. Who is your daddy? Brutal Bob Walker. Far out. He's your daddy? I seen him. He's tough. Looks like you're no slight yourself. <laughs> Where do you come from, beautiful? We moved here from Dallas. Well, welcome to Atlanta, Miss Kitty. Miss Kitty? That's short for Catherine, right? Plus, you got some claws. <laughs> she laughs again, looking at his handsome face and his dreamy sideburns. Well, Kitty, can I buy you a burger and a milkshake? <laughs> sure can, Jack. They turn, and he starts walking them along in his crutches. What happened to your leg? Got wrecked in last week's game. Might be the end of my football dreams, and I don't know how I'm going to lift weights again. Maybe I'll just become a wrestler like your daddy. Oh, yeah? (laughs) How'd you like that? (laughs) Kings of the Ring, episode 42. 
the indecent proposal to Crusher Krawcheck brings in a case of mountaintop beer from the 905 liquor store as he steps into his son's living room where they've been living since they lost their house in bankruptcy court after being sued by the ABC News reporter he smacked. Carl? He looks up at his son and his wife holding a card with a concerned look on her face. What is it now? I don't know what this means, but there was a card taped to the door telling you to go to this address for a surprise. Who's it from? Doesn't say. He puts his beer down, takes the card and reads it. Marigold Way. Where the hell is that? I think it's one of those new streets in town and country, their son says. Town and country must be some richy rich asshole. He goes into the kitchen cabinet and grabs his 357 Magnum, the same one he once pointed at Julian Kane in front of all the boys back in 84, an event he recently discovered was not soon forgotten by the EWF owner, who secretly bought his old house and had it demolished purely for revenge. You want me to go? No. I'll handle this myself. Crusher drives his hulking Cadillac off the highway into the St. Louis suburbs. He gets closer to the address and enters a new housing development, only half filled with large houses and other construction still going on. He grimaces as he drives through, dreading what this could be about. He pulls into the right driveway where there is another car he doesn't recognize. He puts his gun into his holster he wears like a cop and steps out of the car. He takes a deep breath and knocks on the door, ready for anything. Hey, brother, you made it. He breathes a sigh of relief as he looks at the smiling face of Diamond Donny Gold. I didn't expect to see you here. Donny, beer already in hand, is all smiles as he shakes Crusher's hand. Good to see you on your feet. We all heard about your crash. Hey, no. I appreciate the flowers you and Meredith sent. What's with this house? You moving to St. Louis now that SCW is here? What? Uh, oh, no, no, no. Come on in. Let me talk to you about this. Crusher looks around at this huge empty house, except for a six-pack of Budweiser cans and a set of keys on the kitchen counter, which is as large as a tavern bar top. This house would be too big for Goliath. You really need all this space. Donnie peels the tab off the can and hands it to Crusher. Brother, let me talk to you. This plane crash... My back was broken. It was paralyzed from the waist down. I didn't think I'd ever walk again. But now look at me. You got a little limp. That's it. How many bedrooms does this deal have? More than that, Crusher. It's what was on the inside that was really broken. Crusher turns to Donnie, not used to hearing him talk serious like this. Before it could get better, I mean really get better, I had to fix my life. I haven't been the best man I could be, and there are people I could have treated better than I did, and that includes you. Donnie, please. I don't know what you're talking about. If there's anyone I owe in this business, it's you. You don't owe me anything. Girl, I do. I owe you everything. You entrusted me with a lot. In making me WWE World Champion in Thanksgiving 82. And when Julian took over New York, I bailed on the WWE. And even before that, I let being World Champion get to my head. And I mistreated a lot of guys. I ignored a lot of guys. And was rude to even more. And I know I even mistreated you at times. It's nothing, Donnie. I got real problems. I know you do, Crusher. And that's what this is about. What do you mean? This house. I ain't moving to St. Louis, brother. It's yours. What? 
Crusher drops his beer as Donnie plops the keys in his hand. It's over 3,000 square feet, close to the airport. Enough room for your kids and your grandkids and anybody else. Hey, I heard what happened with your house and that sleazy real estate guy having your house wrecked. Crusher gives the keys back. No, Donnie. It's too much. Way too much. Brother, I couldn't even afford places like this if not for what you did for me. You vouched for me at a time when other guys were rooting for me to fail. I proved myself, but I wouldn't have gotten that chance without your seal of approval. Not to mention the rope of the fans for going over on you clean. I can't bring your house back, but I can at least do this. Crusher holding back emotion. Nani, I can't thank you enough. Crusher takes Donnie's hand with both hands and pulls him in tight. My wife will be... You don't know what you've done. I owe you forever. No way, brother. We're square. You reap what you sow in life, and this is where you get yours. Crusher hugs him and starts crying. <laughs> In Calgary, Alberta, Canada, lies the Victoria Pavilion on the Stampede Grounds, longtime home of Calgary Championship Wrestling, run by Frankie Lovejoy, until trading in his World Wrestling Alliance satellite membership for a sales contract to Julian Kane's Empire Wrestling Federation and a title as president of EWF Canada. And while his main function is promoting the EWF shows in Western Canada, he still trains young men into wrestlers. And today, his newest student was hand-delivered by Julian Kane himself and is meeting the entire EWF office for the first time. The small arena is empty, except for a wrestling ring set up in the middle and a dozen or so steel chairs set up. At ringside, Buddy Melrose, Louis the Greek, Les Henderson, Nigel Davies, and the venerable Frankie Lovejoy walk in where Julian Kane stands beside an impressive-looking young man. Gentlemen, I give you Vance Armstrong. The Brain Trust looks over Vance, who's about six foot four and 250 pounds, with a matinee idle face and long curly blonde hair. He takes his shirt off, revealing a rippling, strong golden physique. Holy shit. Wow. Oh my. Vance stands with his hands on his waist like a superhero, stoic and strong, facing the old men while Julian paces around him. Vance, where are you from? Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Now what is the significance of that shitty little town, you ask? AMW tag champion Apocalypse, the number one villain in Nashville, SCW's top young babyface, the most feared Russian tag team in America, and All South Wrestling's top young star, all hail from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, working as bouncers at a dive bar called Mama Bee's. Vance, where did you used to work in Oshkosh? Mama Bee's. Everyone nods. Jesse James went to Mama Bee's to recruit those boys, trained them, and now they're the biggest stars in the World Wrestling Alliance. But not Vance. No, sir. You see, Vance Armstrong was gone that day. So tell us, Vance, where were you? Shooting a movie in South America as a stuntman. Stunt work, gentlemen. Vance wasn't there when Jesse James was. Now tell me, Vance, when you returned from being a stuntman on this movie, did your co-workers and so-called friends tell you about this special visitor they had? Nope. When they all quit their jobs at Mama Bee's out of nowhere and moved away. Did they tell you where they were going and why? Nope. What a bunch of pricks. So tell me, Vance, how did you find out that they became wrestlers? Guys at the bar had to tell me. Guys at the bar had to tell him. Those fuckers ditched Vance Armstrong as part of Jesse James' con job? And do you know why? I can think of a few reasons. Just look at this specimen and tell me what those 
chubby losers were thinking when Jesse James showed up on a white horse and offered those schmucks the keys to the kingdom. Those meatheads knew, in a mind full of rubble, there was one diamond. Their so-called friend, Vance Armstrong. Vance, thinking about what happened, starts flexing, revealing the striations and veins of a godlike physique, drawing gasps from the old men. For as handsome as Bo Riggs is, Vance is more handsome. Vance starts moving around, shadow boxing like Sugar Ray Leonard, and doing karate moves and spinning kicks. For as strong as Vladimir Rykov is, Vance is stronger. Vance falls forward into a handstand and starts walking on his hands, while the EWF office picks their jaws up off the ground. For as fantastically golden as Apollo Samson is, he pales in comparison to Vance Armstrong. Vance returns to his feet and does a complete mid-air backflip. Julian puts his hands on Vance's sweaty, muscular shoulders while he looks at the men, who all move closer, their mouths still agape, in awe of this mega-athlete. Those disloyal sons of bitches kayfabed him when Jesse James came down. They kept this special visit a secret, and now you can see why. Those guys are kindergarten finger paintings, standing next to the Mona Lisa. And now, he is the newest member of the Empire Wrestling Federation. He approaches Frankie Lovejoy, leaning on his cane, and puts his hands on his shoulders and neck. Frankie, if you ever do one thing for me, it is this. I want you to use all your powers and all your skills on to Vance Armstrong. Let me unleash him on the world. The perfect wrestling machine who will one day be the biggest star in the sport. Even bigger than Thor Hansen. With Barry Lovelace out, Kitty is at their house looking at their home they built together, looking at old pictures, thinking of her relationship with Barry, how they met, and all they've been through, and the pain he's going through now, thinking of how she could fix this, somehow, some way. One half of the Olympians, Brad Milkins, is driving his Oldsmobile down Interstate 80 through the frozen cornfields of Iowa, with his partner and pal Nellie Gotch in the back seat, while boss Charlie Gotch is in the front. You know what the biggest difference between amateur wrestling and professional wrestling? The rats. I was NCAA heavyweight champion in 1978, and it got more pussy work in spot shows in Dubuque and Africa in Iowa. Were you expecting a lot of arena rats for college wrestling? At the time, no, but since I started pro, we got rats everywhere, so I was wondering if I was missing out. Uh, yeah, Brad, it's not the same thing. For a guy like me who ain't very good at picking up chicks, pick the right business. I don't need to be a smooth talker like Diamond Donnie. You just sort of line up outside the hotel and you pick them. I mean, where are your favorite rats, Nelly? Milken looks into the rearview mirror at his tag partner, Nelly. Brad, I don't want to talk about that with Dad here. He's, he's around the mother of my grandkids all the time. I don't mind, son. I don't like your wife anyway. Serves it right. What? I can't believe you just came right out and said that. I mean, I know you're not close, but I didn't know it was that bad. Yeah, anyway, we don't run them rat factories like they do in the South, but, uh... Good to get a pipe job once in a while from a nice dolly. Dad! I remember I knew this girl in Fargo. We called her Fargo Fanny. She loved it when the boys came to town. She was a beaut. Looked like Marilyn Monroe if she was ugly. Brother, she could suck the chrome off a trailer hitch. I remember this one time. I don't want to hear this. I do. Tell me about it. Shut up, you two. Turn it up, boy. The American Viking Thor Hansen is coming to Cedar Rapids to defend the country from the African Turn it up, Milkins. Ray told me, but hearing this on the radio makes my blood boil. This is such a bull. Well, Dad, we're doing the right thing, fighting back, putting on our best. 
We had another solid house with Apocalypse working the axis uh, underneath Dan Sanders. Yeah, but we need a little more. Fans enjoy seeing the shrimp and buzz whip beating up on the Jap and the kraut. But I don't think they see them as much of a threat. I'd like someone to give them more of a run for their money. And humble them, too. Well, we ain't bringing in the roughhousers. We need to keep those guys away from each other after what happened at the Super Bowl. Yeah, I ain't seen a shoot last that long before. Uh, I don't think Brick and Tiger try that on the outlaws. Hey, uh, hey, what do you guys think of the Texas outlaws? You know, bringing them in. Texas outlaws? Jesse James has a team with Tex Harper in a decade. I sure as hell ain't bringing that set of a bitch up here. No, no, Dad. Uh, Tex started teaming up with Yosemite Smith years ago. They're regulars in Japan. They're pretty damn good, too. It's actually a great idea, Brad. They're big, tough, intimidating. I don't remember the last time Tex worked AMW. And they're used to that stiff Japanese style. It'll be good for Shark and Buzzsaw to get a taste of their own medicine. I'm going on a short tour to Japan. It'll just be eight days. Should I talk to him? Watch up. Yes. But make sure it clears with me, Kisa. It's one bridge I don't care to burn. This will be good. I, I like that. Texas Outlaws will be good for AMW. Charlie looks out at the highway. Nellie senses some trepidation. Don't worry, Pop. The apocalypse is a strong act for us. People are getting behind him. And King Kong Cyrus is about to start with Dan Sanders. It's gonna work. Oh, what are the figures? The advances? It's solid, Pop. The people of the Midwest are being reminded that AMW is still the best wrestling in the Midwest. To hell with Julian and the Empire. In the Asheville Civic Center in Asheville, North Carolina, the SCW locker room is greeted by a face it hasn't seen in a long, long time. Pretty boy, really deep. Pretty there. Donnie Gold gives a hearty handshake and hug to the former All-South Southern champion. Haven't seen you since the accident. How you doing? Pecker's still working? <laughs> oh, yeah. And the Pipe Brothers are back. Gotta get him tonight, then. Sure thing, brother. I haven't tasted Asheville rats in the longest. You here now, brother? Yep. Talked to Jesse and Hawkins at the Super Bowl. Figured I had my run on top with Bert. He'd never do anything with me again. Jesse promised me a shot, so I figured, what the fuck? Let's go for it. Get the Pipe Brothers back together, since it seems to be your spot. And you're all wrestling again, right? I'm working at it, brother. I was in a wheelchair for a year. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's a miracle I'm even working, thanks to... Sonny looks across the locker room at Kitty, who looks away as soon as they make eye contact. Jesse and Wade and Thorpe's family, you know, getting to know them. It's giving me a new lease on life. I'm a changed man. You're still chasing tail, though, right? You and me got the longest pipes in the business. We got reputations to uphold. The pipe brothers need to work our tag team gimmick at the hotel tonight with a few lucky girls. It's been years. <laughs> we'll see. I'm just trying to get back into shape. I just gotta get rid of this king. Come on, Donnie boy, I need you. Do I have to do the gimmick to get you psyched up? Oh, no. <laughs> Don't do it, brother. Give me no choice, Donnie. I'm gonna do it. Some of the guys start to gather around. Willie puts his bag down and takes off his jacket and starts doing stretches. You got any rats back here? Can't get going having a look at all your ugly faces. He kicks his cowboy boots off and his jeans and his underwear. So his long dick starts swinging around as he moves around. Where's Miss Kitty? Ah, there she is. Well, he sits down on a chair and starts stroking his foot-long sausage while ogling Miss Kitty across the room as the guys chuckle. Come on, Kitty. Hack your skirt up or something. Help me get hard. She gets up and walks off, muttering. What'd you say? Dominic Rose laughs. Gee, you gonna put a cigarette out on your dick if you don't quit looking at it. Oh, that did it. The guys marvel as his dick immediately fills up like a balloon animal. And some of the guys cheer while others shake their heads and walk off. I'm out of here. No, no, you gotta watch this. He's gonna suck his own deal. What? It's impossible. Everyone's looking over now, including Jesse James and Daniel Hawkins. Willie starts to lean forward in his chair. Yeah. Going all the way down, pushing his face towards his own lap until his giant hard penis goes right into his own mouth. The boys cheer while others cover their eyes in embarrassment. 
Jesse James chuckles while Daniel looks like he's gonna vomit. Oh, Lord. This is the guy we had to have? You know we can't do that on TV, right? Willie pulls his underwear back up while Diamond Donnie slaps his hand to give him a five. We're doing it tonight, brother. Hot brothers are back. Lock up the dogs. The Kings of the Ring will be back after these messages. This nerd is in for a blast, a frosty Benata blast, a quick blast of fresh breath that can send your head to places every body dreams of going. Is this yours? The Benata blast. Hello, mother. Hello, father. Greetings from camp. Hiawatha. Swimming school here. But this place is not like home. I miss your nice fresh pillowcases. You miss Downey. It's so pleasing. April freshness. That's one reason. Downey softness. That's another. Downey freshness makes a difference. Love your mother. April fresh Downey. We now return to Kings of the Ring. In the Winnipeg Arena, Purple Punishment collapses from exhaustion after knocking Power Dave Price down with an elbow. Now both men are on their backs. What are you doing? Hurry up and bid me. Purple Punishment slowly rolls to his right to get up. Still taking way too long. Come on, brother, we're going home. The referee encourages him. Purple slowly stands, resisting his reflex to raise his arm as he doesn't want to be cheered at this moment. He picks up Dave slowly. Close on me. That ain't the finish, brother. I'll duck and hit you. He takes Dave and leans him against the ropes, then Irish whips him across the ring. As Dave flings back, he sticks his arm out, purposely high to make it easier for the corporal to duck, but instead, the corporal leaps up with a clothesline of his own, so they both drop each other. Jerry, get up and pin him! Jerry ignores him, still laying there. The referee looks to the timekeeper with a slight shrug. 30 seconds! 30 seconds remaining! This is the, the longest minute in human history, we have to call it! Dave lies there dead as a dog, while Jerry leans up for a second, and then collapses again. The 20 minute time limit has expired! This match has been ruled! A draw! A draw! Dave the power lifter gets back to the hall from the arena floor, where Corporal Punishment waits, taking his wrist tape off. Jerry, you sneaky guy. Not only giving me the draw, but powdering oot so I'm last guy to leaf like I want. Hey, brother, I was just looking out for you. I didn't want to bury you in your hometown. He winks and they shake hands. I appreciate that, brother. I saw my family out there. They pop big. Thank you. Louis the Greek arrives with eyebrow raised. You know, do a job. Well, no, Louis, that was on me. That was my call. I got confused and fucked up the finish. Corporal winks at Dave, who leaves. Come on, Louis. Uh, Dave's from Winnipeg. His kids were at ringside. I didn't want to beat him. This is just a popcorn match of Canada. No big deal. <laughs> Always think of your kids, don't you? <laughs> he shrugs. But don't do it again. I give finish, or you do a finish. At the Irish McNeil's Boys Club in Shreveport, Louisiana, All South Wrestling is taping for TV. As Bert Ironside, his nephew and erstwhile apprentice Chris Stanley, and Booker Peyton Thomas face the halls. <sighs> Will the Danes down skedaddle to Atlanta? Apollo's gone. Now Brick Sawyer's our champ. Peyton pulls the pencil from behind his ear and looks down at his clipboard with the format for tonight's taping. When Apollo walked out the cage match, we had no choice but to award Brick the winner. Still have to come up with an explanation for TV. What the hell happened? Tell the truth. Apollo's a yellow belly coward and quit wrestling. Yeah, that's long and short of it. Problem is, we've been telling the people all year long that we's the best thing since sliced cheese. Just like we told everyone Raphael Angel was your son. We're losing the trust of the people, Bert. It's starting to show. Peyton opens the curtain to reveal the sparse crowd. With far more empty seats than usual, even for this small building. I know this wasn't the plan, but Rick has a belt. Do we go with it or put it on someone else? Who? I mean, probably Gabriel, right? Bert makes a face. What? He never likes being the champ, and this will be the second time I put the belt on him as a placeholder. 
Besides, he's working a program with the Rebels. Can't be singles champ while feuding with three guys. Yep, no more partner to work the Rebels either. Truth be told, Gabriel's the only guy we got we can really trust to not jump to the Empire or another territory, retire from the sport on the spot, or generally screw us over. Yeah, Brick is a bit of a rambler. He's a type who could just up and piss off to Puerto Rico or Japan. Let's do it tonight. Gabe will understand the deal and we'll figure out the Rebels later. Maybe we put the Angel Rebel feud on ice for now. I had kind of a quick idea. Chris Stanley jumps in. I mean, on the bright side with Apollo out, it at least frees Gabriel to join up with an actual tag team, so it's three on three. Where before, that would have put them four on three, which we couldn't do because the heels would be the underdogs. True, but we're a little light on tag teams. It was Apollo and Gabriel in a bunch of heels. By design. What about Wendell McCoy and Steve Roberts? They've been teaming. They're too small to work a main event program. Major used to be working underneath too. Done a lot of jobs on TV and our shows. Well, I'm not sure if he gave these guys a push. Most fans had even recognized who they are. I mean, they were sort of like wallpaper before, just blending in the background. But if we gave them a gimmick, that might elevate them, right? What kind of gimmick? They're too little. You don't want to waste a push on guys like that. It doesn't have to be a waste. Sometimes being smaller can be an advantage. <laughs> what world is that? Well, they can do the high flyer moves, top rope stuff. Some guys are getting over doing That's it. If SCW is going to steal guys like Willie Dean from us, let's steal their big gimmick. What do you think, Uncle? <laughs> you mean make our own rock and rollers? I like your style, young man. Rock and rollers are undersized, but they're over, big time. And they sell for the big guys like the Russians, and the fans love them. That's true. We need some more acts for the girls anyway. They good looking enough? <laughs> or you give me heat for trying to recreate Leroy Brown, and then an angel boy? Well, I'm with the kid on this, Bert. This is different. And it's not much of a risk, really. I reckon if it falls flat, they'll just stay in the undercard. Let's try it out. All right. Tell them to go buy gimmicks like the rock and rollers. All them handkerchiefs and shit. We can call them uh, the rock stars. I don't think we should copy them so exact. But why not? It's a time-honored tradition. You'd have the terrible Sheik work in Ohio, and Charlie book Sheik Hassan in California. You got Hercules Harris in Charlotte, and Clyde Simmons in Atlanta. Uh, Hercules and Clyde aren't anything alike, except they're both black. Anyway, there's got to be a way we can copy the, the formula of the rock and rollers without literally Xeroxing the rock and rollers. With what? Um, I, I don't know. Just go with the rock stars. Just, uh, can you give me a week, Uncle? I'll come up with something good, I promise. No, I want to start them out this weekend. I'll give you until then. For well, the rock stars are team of Gabriel against Southern Rebels in love. Corporal Punishment, with half a six-pack of Molson beer, says goodnight to the other wrestlers as he waits for the elevator to get back to his room. When the door opens, and inside, in a cashmere overcoat and a $5,000 suit, is his boss, Julian Kane. Oh, uh, evening, Julian. Jerry's in such a good mood. The last thing he wants is a lecture about his match, since Louie probably stooged him out. Corporal Punishment, I need to talk to you. <sighs> Listen, I'm sorry, Julian. But Dave's from Winnipeg. Louie already let me have it. It was a one-time deal. What are you talking about? The finish. Uh, I changed the finish. You did what? Uh, uh, nothing. What would you want to talk to me about? What did you do? I was supposed to go over on Powerlifter Dave, but uh, I ran long and it went to a draw instead. It was just a mistake. It won't happen again. Uh, fine, whatever. It won't matter after this anyway. After what? We're going to make some changes with you. Since you came back... You've been obedient and kept your nose down. Except tonight. Well, what happened again with your finish? You changed it? Julian, I, I can explain. I had the best of intentions. See, these are the reasons why I can't trust you and why I'm not sure I even want to do this. Do what? <sighs> Part of me was going to come over here and fire you just because. But instead, you might be in line for the biggest push of your life. As in headlining Empire Mania 3 in a stadium. What? 
Jesus Christ Almighty, thank the Lord. I prayed and prayed that he had a plan, and, and now I see he does. It's all paying off. Thank you, Julian. Thank right you. enough already. I'm not promising anything. All I'm saying is, if you play your cards right, this could end up big for you. What do I have to do? You're going to turn your back on America. Say what? We're turning you heel. We don't need two Leroy Browns, and we don't need two Patriots. Thor Hansen is Mr. America. He doesn't need a sidekick or a junior version running around, but he can always use top heels. It's Thor and only Thor representing patriotism in America. So you're going to do one better. You're not only turning heel, but you're going to swear your allegiance to the Soviet Union. You'll be an American turncoat, a Russian traitor. And if we do this right, the biggest heel in the EWF. Miss Kitty looks in the hallway mirror, freshening up her lipstick, looking even sexier than usual. She enters the hotel bar in her tight gold dress and finds Daniel Hawkins at a small table alone watching the TV behind the bar. Good evening, Daniel. The seat taken? Oh, Kitty! Oh, sorry. Uh, here you go. He nervously clears a spot at his small table from his pile of drinks. Can I get you a drink? She takes his red drink and its tall glass and puts it on her wet lips without saying a word, just looking at him. He signals to the bartender. Can I get another cherry bounce? She sits apart from the table so Daniel can see her legs, which she crosses in front of him, brushing them against his. Just uh, watching the news, uh, Jack Valiant, CNN, it's news 24 hours a day. Uh, Donnie, Willie, and everyone are rounding up all the rats at JT's Roadhouse. It's going to be nuts. Better up here at the hotel where it's safe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Daniel, I never realized how funny you are. Really? No one ever called me funny before. <laughs> I guess I get intimidated. You're this rich, powerful businessman. You're kind of scary. She leans back and takes a breath, showing off her cleavage, shining in the bar lights. Daniel can barely keep his eyes off her breasts. No, no, please. No, um, don't be intimidated. He leans forward and puts his hand on her knee. I mean, I'm just a regular Joe. Nothing regular about you, Daniel. I've seen you. She puts her hands on his hand and keeps them on her knee. You're so smart and have so much command over the locker room. It's sexy. And he starts to turn red as beads of sweat form on his forehead. Daniel starts to go with it as he can see she's turned on by his power. Well, um, it is a tough job, but uh, I don't mind putting the hammer down if I have to. You know, I don't know who's boss. Oh, yes. I can tell you like to be in control. <laughs> yes, but um, the door is always open if you uh, want to talk about anything. <laughs> he squeezes her knee and tries to act reassuring as a girl brings another of the brandy-based cherry bounces for him. Well, that's great to hear because I do want to talk to you about something. Me and Barry. Yes? We've been working this territory the longest. The people know us. We're over. What would you think about putting the belt on Barry? Barry? She releases his hands, and he sits back. What's the harm in a short run? A quickie title change? Something for the record books, but won't affect the business? I know, but Barry Lovelace is the world champion. I mean, I like him. He's a great gimmick act, but the world champion? The Alliance Board would never go for that, and Jesse wouldn't either. He'd kill me. She leans forward and puts her hand on his knees, showing her glistening breasts and looking up at him seductively. You're the boss, aren't you? She pouts. <laughs> he gasps, and she can see him getting hard under his slacks. Well, yeah. And what you say goes, right? So, make it happen. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Kitty, but... She takes his hand puts it on the inside of her thigh, slowly moves it up. Jesse, won't you do it? She takes his finger and puts it in her mouth, 
and sucks on it seductively. Oh my god. Daniel, would you like to have me? Oh yes. Please. Oh god. Oh please. This is the deal. When Barry Lovelace wins the world title, you can have me that night. And there will be nothing quickie about it. Woo! Things getting hot and heavy in SCW. Today's deleted scene was Corporal Punishment going over his match with Dave the Powerlifter and asking Louie to put him over. If you heard that, then you're listening to the extended edition of Kings of the Ring, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did not hear that scene, then we invite you to become a patron of Kings of the Ring by visiting patreon.com slash kingsotr, where you get all of the deleted scenes from the entire series, but you will get to hear new episodes two full weeks before anyone else, plus breaking kayfabe access, the exclusive podcast series that explains the Easter eggs, like the real-life inspiration for Miss Kitty's indecent proposal to Daniel Hawkins, and the real-life wrestler who inspired Willie Dean's superhuman ability to blow himself. And of course, top guys and top girls get characters named after them. You'll be in the show and in the books. And again, a big thank you to 80s legend, the genius Lanny Poffo, for joining the show as Vance Armstrong. And of course, you the fans for tuning in and spreading the word on the most unique podcast in all of wrestling. 